My name is Jenny Safran. I'm not going to have a lot of time to speak today, but I have my email up here. So if you're particularly interested in anything I gloss over, feel free to email me. In particular, the methods for all the studies I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to be able to talk about. But just trust me that the people doing this work know what they're doing. Um, so what I'd like to do is to try to take us from sound waves and frequencies and spectrograms up to what it is that we all really care about, which is that experience that what music makes us think of and feel and how we get there. And because I'm a developmental psychologist, I believe that the roots of understanding this, along with everything else, lie in understanding little people. And so I'm going to begin. The Newton Wisconsin Science Festival is indeed beginning at 5.30 in the forum. High Hybrid Cinema presents Mad Scientist Inc. Wow. Head over to the forum now to catch this great presentation. <laughs> I could be a math scientist. In the Thank you. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is start by talking about very young infants and their musical preferences, what they're into and why a little bit, and then move from there to talk about how we learn about music and end with um, hopefully uh, a little bit of a sense of um, uh, what underlies the feelings that we get when we experience music leading up to the Brahms Trio. So the beginnings of the musical mind originate as early as we can possibly study them. So it turns out that newborn infants, like adults, process musical pitch in the right hemisphere of the brain. Um, we actually tend to process pitch on the right, timing differences on the left, but this is observed even as soon after birth as you can measure it. Um, moreover, infants have some pretty well-structured preferences. They prefer to listen to people singing in an infant-directed way than people singing in an adult-directed way. So people have run experiments where they have a mother sing the same song to pretending that her baby's there and to an adult. The changes are pretty small, but babies prefer the infant-directed ones. And this is analogous to what we see in speech, where infants greatly prefer, even at birth, people who talk like this <laughs> over people who talk like that. This is more interesting. It carries a lot of emotional stuff, too. Um, oh, that's weird. OK, come back. Aha. Um, infants also share our preference, one that you and I presumably share, for music that is consonant, not dissonant. So what do I mean by that? I'm actually going to play you some stimuli from an experiment. Here we go. This is consonant music, and this is music where the, harm the harmonic relationships uh, have nice ratios between them, octaves, fifths, perfect fourths. N even newborn infants prefer this over that, as I'm guessing, do you? OK. Now, sorry, it's not going away. It'll be done in a sec. <laughs> But here's something cool. You might imagine that that could be because of postnatal exposure, or excuse me, it could be because of prenatal exposure. Maybe the fetus hears his or her mother singing during pregnancy. And indeed, sound does carry fairly well from the mother's voice into the uterus. But in a study that was done in Japan, researchers actually investigated babies who were born hearing whose mothers were deaf. And so they didn't hear any singing in the womb. They didn't hear any music in the womb because they actually can't really hear stuff that's way out there. They can only hear stuff that's right here. And they show the same preference for consonants over dissonance at birth. And it actually turns out that this isn't even a human thing. So you see the same results in newborn chicks who have never heard music before, uh, macaques, infant chimpanzees, starlings, it's a bird species. And this goes way back. So Helmholtz pointed out these issues about what octaves are and what their physics are. My favorite, though, is Leonard Bernstein um, in his Harvard lectures back in the 70s, 60s, actually made the point that certain of these um, musical patterns are potentially universal, uh, even before he knew any of the science that was going on since then in, in these experiments. So even newborns are pretty sophisticated listeners. They're like chicks and macaques. That's pretty good. <laughs> now, six to eight months later, infants actually are much more sophisticated listeners. Now, they even prefer maternal singing over maternal speech. So they'd rather hear their mom sing to them than their mom talk to them, um, even if their mom's not a really good singer. So that's sort of cool. Um, they can detect changes in pitch contour very well. So if they're listening to a melody and it's always going down, then suddenly if it goes up, they're going to alert to that. They're going to find that more interesting. 
in a study we did in our lab, there was actually a, uh, a sophomore summer honors uh, project a number of years ago. Um, we found that baby, we sent a CD of Mozart piano sonatas home with babies, uh, I forget how old, I think six months. They listened to them for two weeks, and then they couldn't listen to them for two weeks. And then we brought them in and tested them, and we were able to show that they remembered the music they had heard two weeks previously, um, Mozart piano sonatas. Of course, it was Michiko Uchida, so it was you know, particularly good performances, but still. Um, they're very good at detecting changes in rhythm, both visually and auditorily, and they can do something really surprising, which is integrate vestibular and auditory cues. So in this experiment, what the researchers did was they had the babies listen to an ambiguous rhythm that could either be duple meter, like a march, one, two, three, four, or like a waltz, one, two, three, one, two, three. Same rhythm, but they bounced the baby, either so it would be a duple or a triple. So I'm going to show you videos from this experiment because they're kind of cool. So here's a baby. So this rhythm's actually ambiguous. Um, here's, that's the duple condition, and here's a baby in the triple condition. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And what they found, which is kind of cool, it's kind of a crazy study, um, but this paper was published in Science. Um, what they found, these are the training stimuli, so you can see boom, -tsh, boom, 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 -tsh. so it's ambiguous. And in the duple condition, they were bounced on the duple beats. Triple condition, they were bounced on the triple beats. Um, here's data where the babies were being bounced, and they, they uh, listened longer to test items that were consistent with the rhythm with which they were bounced. Same thing happens if they're blindfolded. They don't have to see to get this. But if they're not bounced, but they watch someone else bounce, you don't get the effect. So these infants are actually able to integrate their own experience of bouncing into how they're interpreting an ambiguous auditory rhythm at this age. But that said, they're still actually very open-minded compared to adults. And to explain what I mean by that, I have to draw an analogy with, with speech, which is actually my, my main area of research. Um, you will all know from trying to learn a foreign language as a teenager or an adult that it's very hard to perceive sounds that are not in your native language. So it turns out that infants, young infants, can perceive differences between speech sounds from languages all over the world, regardless of what language they're learning. But adults can't. So there are classic examples like adult uh, Japanese speakers cannot perceive the difference between ra and la. English speakers cannot perceive the difference between Hindi d sounds. Any Hindi speakers here? Can you do the d d? Like the retroflex. It's like da da. And there's two different d's. No, not that one. There's another Hindi difference. What? Oh, can you do them again? Then I must not have been able to hear. Yeah, it's the first and the third sound the same to English speakers. Um, but they don't sound the same to you. So thank you, that was perfect. It was the ordering, I couldn't hear through this. Here's what's really cool. By the time babies are 10 to 12 months of age, they can no longer perceive sounds that are not in their native language either. So an, uh, a Japanese infant at six months can perceive the difference between ra and la, but by 10 to 12 months, they can no longer do that perception. They can't tell the difference anymore. So what's happening is we're becoming a native listener. We're sort of being shaped by our native language. And it turns out we see the same thing for musical systems as well. So this is a, a quite old study, but it's very clever. And what they did was um, they played babies a melody, a nice C major. Uh, let me, I'll sing it for you. La, 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 la. Very simple melody. And then what they, oh, sorry, I gave you the data. Then what they did was they made one of two changes. They either changed this note to be within the key, la, 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 or they changed it to be out of the key, la, 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 la. That's hard for me to even sing. Um, adults only detect this change. This sounds fine. If you play them this over and over and then you play that, adults don't notice that. But eight-month-old babies do. And that's because they don't know very much about Western tonal music yet. They haven't learned the tonal system. And so the fact that they don't know very much is actually really great. It means they notice things that we adults don't notice, just like in speech, which is cool. 
Um, and in a very recent set of studies, researchers have shown the same thing in rhythm. Um, and I actually have a demo of this where I can test you. And if there's time at the end, I'll come back to it. Um, but what they did was they took subjects um, who were either uh, Americans or from the Balkans. Now, Balkan music has very complicated rhythm. It's, there's a lot of syncopation. There's a lot of layering. And what they found were, was very cool. They found that adults who are not accustomed to these complex rhythms did not notice changes in these rhythms. But six-month-old babies did. And adults who are used to Balkan music did. They then did a training study. They took 11 to 12-month-olds who can't actually tell the can't detect these changes in complex rhythms either. They gave them two weeks of exposure. They sent home CDs of Balkan music. And lo and behold, after two weeks of exposure, the 11 to 12 month olds were able to detect changes in the complex rhythms. But adults with two weeks of exposure could not. Because two weeks is not enough time to override 21 or 25 or 43 years of hearing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we get stuck in our native system with experience. Now, how is it that we become native listeners? Um, what's this process that allows us to go from sort of, you know, I like tonal, I like consonant music, I like certain intervals, that's all nice, to actually knowing a lot about a specific musical system, be it Western tonal music or Javanese gamelan or Schoenberg or whatever it is that you're into, jazz. Well, a hypothesis that, um, we originally derived from work in language that we, we and many others have now applied to music, and this is now very quite accepted in the field, and it was alluded to in Matt's talk, is that part of how we learn about the auditory world, and actually the visual world too, and the social world as well, is that we attend to, it sounds fancier than it is, but our brains do statistics. So we keep track of how likely certain events are to occur. We keep track of what follows what. And it turns out that this is a very powerful idea, not just in language where it's been explored much more fully, but also in music. And I'm gonna give you just a couple of examples of that. One example is this. I'm gonna play you a little sequence of notes from a study that we did. It's actually not the notes that are written here. You've never heard the sequence before. It's actually not following any rules of Western tonal music construction. But it turns out that you're keeping track of a lot of stuff when you're listening to that sequence. Um, in fact, there's two kinds of things you can keep track of. One is the sequence of absolute pitches. So how likely is a C sharp given an A? Something like that. The other is information about the statistics of relative pitches. These are intervals. So what's the likelihood of a minor third going up after a major third going down? Um, you can think of this in terms of what's the likelihood of the uh, like twinkle, twinkle, little star interval being followed by um, here comes the bride interval, something like that. Another way to depict this is we, we expose learners. We expose eight-month-olds and adults, for example, to sequences like this, where certain notes follow one another with some regularity, but at these breaks where the colors change, then it's less predictable what's going to come next. We can write the same sequence out in terms of uh, intervals, so um, descending minor sixth is followed by an ascending major third. And again, the colors point to where we have good predictable continuations. It's very predictable that this is going to be followed by that, but we don't really know what's going to come after the major third because it could be any of these possible things. And it turns out, again, across a number of different studies, that we can play these sequences to adults and babies, but they actually kind of learn different stuff. It turns out, rather surprisingly, that infants preferentially track absolute pitches. So what they're remembering is that A is followed by C sharp, and C sharp is followed by D. Whereas adults are tracking relative pitches. They're tracking, oh, I heard a perfect fourth followed by a minor third. Now, on the one hand, that sounds surprising, because we think of absolute pitch as sort of a fancy thing. But if you stop and think about it, thinking about what we heard in the previous talks, the cochlea and the cortex have tonotopic maps. They're keeping track of particular frequency bands. And so it seems that that's actually an easier way for babies, at least, to encode the world. But it's not very useful. If we went all around remembering the absolute pitches of everything we heard, like if I only recognized happy birthday in C major and I didn't recognize it in D major, or if you say the word cup up here and cup down there, 
and I think they're different words, I'm going to be really messed up. So relative pitch is actually much more useful. Now the story is actually much more complicated. We in the lab can flip people from tracking relative to absolute pitches pretty easily doing different manipulations of our materials. That's neither here nor there. The interesting thing here is that we have access to this perceptual information and we can track it and remember it and we learn from it. Now to follow up on one of the points that Matt made in his talk, what, part of what we do as we learn about a musical system is we develop expectations. We're predicting all the time what's going to come next. And we've actually tried to study this in the lab by looking at the kinds of predictions people make with musical systems. One thing we did was actually to analyze a corpus of Bach chorales. And we discovered that there's actually a pretty clear probability structure in Bach chorales. So um, what these things mean, um, if there's a minor three chord, which means a minor chord built on the third chord in the, uh, uh, the three chord in the key, then that tends to be followed by a minor six chord 47% of the time in a Bach chorale. That's pretty good. But if a minor six, but if you go the other way, minor six is only followed by a minor three 2% of the time. So there's actually very, very strong regularities in musical systems. And when we ask musicians and non-musicians to make judgments about little excerpts, they follow these probabilities. So we are aware of them, and they're part of what we know about music. We've also made up our own novel genres and tried to see whether people learn these statistics on the fly. So in one of our studies, we took Bach chorales and we ran them backwards. So the statistics were all messed up. Here's a backwards chorale. Uh, sounds pretty bad, right? Um, in, another system, in another study set of studies, we wrote our own musical system in the Phrygian mode, for those of you who know what that is. Oops, sorry, that's Bach, backwards Bach again. Ah, come back. Well, it doesn't matter. It's, that sounds weird. So we play people sequences like this, and we've built statistics in so certain chord structures follow one another with certain regularities. And what we find when we do this sort of thing is that learners pick up on this really fast. And so if you imagine a lifetime of hearing a musical genre, it's not surprising that part of what we're doing is developing expectations and predicting things based on the structure of the musical system. Yep, I'm almost done. Last slide, actually. Now, what do we do with all this knowledge? Well, we actually, um, one of the things that I've found the most fascinating in research on music in the brain and music cognition over the, uh, the past couple of the past decade is that it turns out that certain phenomenological experience that we experiences that we have actually can be studied in the lab and turn out to have very interesting consequences. So how many of you guys have ever experienced chills or goosebumps when you're listening to a piece of music? Every, pretty much everyone. And that's part of, at least for me, why I go to listen to music is, you know, you want that feeling, right? Well, um, it turns out that when you ask people to nominate what music gives them chills, first of all, there's some consistency, which is kind of interesting. Um, this is from Robert Satori's lab at McGill. And these are, this is just a list of the musical excerpts that people nominate. The majority, the biggest ones are things like Barber's Adagio for strings, uh, Beethoven's ninth second movement. So you bring people into the lab and you put them in the magnets. So you do a pet, pet imaging on them, or you measure hormones, or you measure heart rate. And it turns out that all this stuff happens when you're listening to a mu music that leads to a peak emotional experience for you. Um, and someone mentioned at the beginning that the other sessions that were going on right now had to do with beer. Um, it turns out that it's the same systems that have to do with other stimuli that we find very rewarding. Drugs of abuse, sex, um, other stuff like that. It's the same <laughs> brain systems that are activated as when we're listening to music that we find um, emotionally incredibly exciting. So without further ado, I think we can all maybe turn to listen to some actual music and have some chill induction of our own. So thank you very much.